Thank you, Zhang Kang. And for our next speaker's session, let's give a warm welcome to Inche Sufis Mohamed Sofian, co-founder of Recur Consult, to share with us his topic on gamification in UX design. With over eight years' experience, he has designed award-winning engagement frameworks by leveraging gamification design methodologies and behavioral models. Inche Sufis has spearheaded gamification and behavioral design projects for Fortune 500 companies, multinationals, and more, and he's sure to provide us with some great insights. Hello everyone, my name is Sufis from Rico Consult and I'm here to talk about gamification and UX design. So welcome to Data Asia, so I hope you enjoy this session. So a bit about myself, right? So my name is Sufis. Uh, and I am a gamification behavioral design consultant. So basically what I do is I work with companies to create gamification and behavioral design frameworks so that they can create engagement and interesting experiences for their products and experiences so that they can engage users, right? So I am the co-founder of Rico Consult and I'm a certified Octalysis gamification practitioner, one of the few in the world. So I'm about number 130 in the world. Uh, I'm also affiliated with a few organizations like GameFat, Masaga, Play 14 and GCOE, to name a few. And I've had the privilege of designing a lot of award-winning gamified solutions. So I don't own them, but I had the chance to build these solutions with my clients and partners all over the world. Right? I've also had the privilege to work with various different companies, Fortune 500s, multinationals, GLCs, and startups, to name a few. And I'm also a corporate trainer as well. Right? So before we begin, Let's talk about gamification. So what is gamification? It has become a buzzword over the past 10 years and not much understanding has come about as to what it really is. In fact, a lot of misconceptions have come about instead. So let's begin by clearing the air. So gamification is basically a process where you add games or game-like environments or elements into something so that you encourage participation out of enjoyment. So you make something basically less interesting before to something more enjoyable after using gamification. But it doesn't sound so simple, right? So there's a lot of things that you need to th take into consideration as you build this thing. So we'll share about this in the next hour or so, right? So let's dive in. So what is the difference between games and gamification? So people think that gamification basically means turning something into a game. Though it can be in some cases, but not all the time. So a game is basically a closed environment, right? So when a player interacts with a the game, they're interacting with the game itself. And whatever happens in a game stays in the game. Kind of like Vegas, right? And it doesn't incite anything outside of that environment. Whereas gamification, its main intention is to encourage participation and an outward uh, reaction outside of the environment. So for example, you want to motivate someone to do something outside of the experience, whether it's to buy something or to click something or to visit something and so on and so forth. It's a means to an end. So how does gamification fit in UX design then, right? So there are four ways, of, four ways that gamification can contribute to UX design. And the first is that it increases the immediacy and relevance for users, right? So it makes something more prevalent to them and also more relevant to them. And the next bit is that it motivates users to complete certain desired actions. So we use the word desired actions here because when you know what you want them to do in the experience, for example, you want them to click something, you want them to add a friend or refer a friend or to add something to a cart, for example. So how do you motivate them to do that? And that's, that can be accomplished using gamification. The next one is you can overcome negative associations with the experience, right? So this depends on the experience, but generally when someone comes in with a certain uh, perception, right? Maybe they heard something or they just have a certain bias. Using something like gamification can help overcome those biases or negative associations. And the last but not least is you want users to be willing to engage with the experience. So they become more interested. They become uh, willing to go into it without being forced to do so, right? So you don't have to drive them with benefits and rewards or constantly bombard them with uh, advertising or messages. They just come into the experience willingly, right? So this is one kind of comical example of what gamification or what people think gamification is like, you know? In this particular comic strip, as you can read, uh, 
watching paint, of course, is not so interesting, but you think that, oh, you know what? If I gamify this, people want to do it, right? In this case, they put a leaderboard and you see that this particular character is engaged with the experience so that they increase their ranks. And a lot of people think that this is the magic of gamification. You do this to anything, they will engage with that particular activity. And I've worked with so many clients in the past and they find out that this doesn't work. And then they say, look, gamification doesn't work. And the reality is that this is not how you do gamification, right? Uh, you don't engage them by just putting an, a gamified element. You have to understand a lot of things that go behind the process, right? So who are the users and so on and so forth. So we'll be sharing more on this as we go. So before we take a short break, I wanted to just touch on this a little quick. This is a very common misconception or common association people have with gamification. That it's about these three elements, points, badges, and leaderboards. And you'll find out after this break that it's a lot more than that. So uh, enjoy your short break and we'll see you in a bit. It is becoming increasingly difficult to engage users in an experience. With increasing distractions and shortening attention spans, it takes considerable effort to keep users continuously engaged, let alone drive their behaviors in a way that positively impacts your bottom line. In order to increase user engagement and brand loyalty, companies have resorted to providing extrinsic rewards to users in exchange for carrying out a particular behavior, such as signing up for a newsletter, adding items to the shopping cart, or returning to the same service provider over and over again. Though effective, such rewards quickly become expensive to upkeep, and users continue to become harder to engage over time as they turn their attention to more interesting options in the market. Gamification has quickly become a buzzword among professionals across industries over the past decade with increasing interest in applying gamification in various ways in order to drive user engagement. Combined with behavioral design principles, which examines the psychology behind behaviors and habits, gamification has begun to uncover hidden value in existing experiences by effectively incorporating game elements in an environment to drive desired user behaviors. Today, gamification can be seen in different environments, such as social media platforms, e-commerce websites, mobile applications, and classrooms. With engagement becoming the new currency for success, it is no surprise that many organizations are incorporating gamified elements into their products and services in order to increase their user base and ultimately their bottom line. Recur Consult has worked with various organizations across the region to craft engaging user experiences in any environment. Speak to our consultants to learn more about our consultation services and how gamification can drive your business results today. Welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed your short break. So let's pick up where we left off. So we last talked about points, badges, and leaderboards. Kind of the very popular elements that people associate with gamification. And what happens is that a lot of companies tend to assume that to gamify something, all you need to do is just add a point system, add a badge system, add a leaderboard system. And sure, there are some instances where this does work, but in reality that 99% of the time, not so well. And we'll talk about this a little more, but basically before you dive into any elements or incorporate any gamified elements to your experience, you really need to understand what's relevant to one, your experience, uh, what actions you want to see your users carry out, and also what your users really care about, right? And these are some things that we often overlook because, you know, if it works in some other experience, for example, maybe a competitor or a reference that you have, it should work for yours, right? Not really. So let's talk about this. Well, in UX, there are some common gamified elements, and this might be more effective in, in general applications. Uh, we'll talk about them a bit more and how they will be very effective for some, and we'll also see whether they would be applicable to your experience, whether you have a product or a service that you're trying to build or enhance using gamification. So the first one is challenges and streaks, followed by progress bars, points and in-app currencies, badges and stickers, leaderboards and social interactions, rewards and collectibles. So you'll see those three that we mentioned before are also here in some ways, but 
the way you, these companies may use them will be different. So we'll share some examples for you to have a look. Okay. So the first one is challenges and streaks. So you'll see here there are three examples. Uh, the first one is from Duolingo. So Duolingo is a very popular language learning app and it uses a lot of gamified elements. And I mean a lot. In fact, pretty much 90% of the experience is heavily gamified and in a very good way. And as they built their app over the past few years, they have tweaked that experience even more to make it even better, right? So you can see that they have some challenges here. For example, they have to maybe do a couple of lessons. They have to complete a certain number of things. And then they also get to increase their streak or their progress. So you can see on the second image, there's a one day streak, right? And as they continue logging in every day, their streak continues, right? And this creates a sense of uh, progress, a sense of accomplishment, and you don't want to lose this progress, right? Because if you don't log in one particular day, you break your streak. So it will be quite a waste. And challenges will, are able to kind of give you context as to what you should do in the experience, right? Whether in this case, you'll see in the, the rightmost example, uh, it's a uh, challenge from the actual Data Asia conference itself. So you'll see that you're supposed to visit a booth, for example. So this may change when you actually enter the experience, but this is the examples that we have for now. So this gives you an idea of what you can do in the experience that you may not be aware of, right? And this paints a clear picture in the user's head as to, okay, I'm here, what do I do? I look at the challenges and I know that, okay, I can do these things. And as I progress, the challenges should get slightly more difficult so that you don't get bored as well, right? It keeps, it keeps things interesting, it keeps you engaged. So the next example, which is, after this is progress bars. So progress bars are a very popular uh, gamified element as well. It gives you a sense of progress, right? So when you do something, you see this bar fill up slowly and you get this sense of accomplishment. I'm doing something, I'm doing it correctly. And I'm about to finish it and I'm done, right? And this helps you finish that thing, finish that particular task or action that you need to do. And this is very common, especially when it comes to when you are signing up for something or onboarding into an experience, right? So we can see on the first image, you can see there's a bar at the very top that's almost filled. So this is basically a tutorial as to what you're supposed to do and how you use the app. This is also from Duolingo. The second image shows a crown that's been lit up with the rest or the other four still being grayed out. So it shows that, oh, you're already one step there. You have four more to go. And it gives you a sense of, oh, you're making progress as well. But it doesn't always have to look like this, right? So in this particular conference in Data Asia, uh, we've taken a different approach, right? So you'll see that if you look closely, there are actually exclamation marks placed on different booths, right? And if you've interacted with that particular element, it would disappear. So if you walked into a specific area or a booth, you'll see what you've done and what you've not interacted with. And this gives you a sense of progress, also a sense of what you have not done yet. And some people will be driven to complete everything because they want to see a clean, image of no exclamation marks, for example, right? So you may have already experienced this in a conference uh, and it makes, basically drives you to explore more in the space that you're currently in, right? So let's move on. The next one is points, very, very popular, right? Uh, and also very misused. Uh, a point system only has meaning if you give it meaning to the users. And most often the number one, the number one mistake that companies make is that Whatever the user does, they are immediately awarded points. And they're not told what the points are for, how they're collected, and what they can uh, redeem them for, if there's anything worth redeeming for, right? So collecting points for the sake of it actually means nothing to the user. So you'll see that a lot of the programs use points a lot. And usually when you collect these points, they can be converted to rewards. So that gives it significance, but at the same time, you wanna make sure that collecting these points isn't too difficult, right? So if you have to do a lot just to collect a small amount of points, people may not feel that it's worth the effort. So that's something to keep in mind when you use this, this system. Another one is in-app currencies, which is similar as well, because they are kind of interchangeable. It just depends on how you want to look at it and how you want to present it in your experience. But they basically function the same way. You do something and you can earn points or currencies that can be used back in the environment itself. Another common example, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, is social media. So this picture with the cat uh, is from Instagram and you can see that the points you collect here are from likes. People giving you hearts on your image. You, you can't use that for anything but that gives you a sense of 
accomplishment, a sense of recognition. You feel like, you know, whatever image you presented, whether it's something you created yourself or you found somewhere or you were inspired by, you or relate to, you share it here and people respond to it, you know? And the amount of likes you get will kind of make you feel more and more accomplished, which has a certain effect to some users, but you know, that's a whole different conversation. But at the end of the day, that is the power of collecting points. Uh, and in this case, you don't redeem it for anything. But at the same time, there has a, there's been a significance given to the user in collecting those likes or points, right? And the last image is from Duolingo as well. So this is basically after completing a lesson or a course, you get gems. And these gems can be used to kind of uh, redeem certain benefits or rewards in the app that can be used back in the app. So we call these boosters. So when you get boosters, it will enhance your experience further and also make you more invested in the experience. Because whatever you earn and redeem for in the form of boosters can only be used in the experience. Meaning, if you want to get the full benefit, you have to come back. Right? So that is points and eat app currencies. The next one is badges and stickers. So on another uh, abused game element as well. Uh, you do something or do enough for something, you get a badge. Uh, and this works great for some people. Some people really care about badges. They feel like, oh, you know what? I'm, I want to collect all of them. Right? Kind of like collecting stamps by, by doing certain tasks. But if you reward badges just for the sake of rewarding badges, you know, logging in, you get a badge. Uh, you fill up your profile, you get a badge. It becomes kind of meaningless and pointless. So you want to give significance to the badges as well. And you want to make sure that they earn it as opposed to are given out like a freebie. So you kind of see in the first two images, those are badges that you have to earn by doing certain things, right? Uh, the second image is from Foursquare. Uh, it's not around anymore, but Foursquare had a really good badge system. And people were very driven to kind of check in to certain locations more frequently so they can earn certain badges and kind of be the most checked in person to that particular venue or location. And the rightmost is uh, from Facebook. So if you are an avid user of Facebook, especially Facebook groups, right? So whether you're a member or you have set up your own group as an admin or moderate a group, you'll notice that frequent users or certain kinds of users will be awarded badges. For example, they could be a pioneering member of the group. They signed up early to the group. Or they've been interacting with a lot of posts and commenting a lot. So they become a top fan. So these are badges earned through action. So the more they do something, or if they do something at a certain point of time, they'll be awarded these unique badges. So all this gives you a sense of accomplishment because then these badges are typically displayed for others to see. It's kind of like a trophy of sorts, you know? You show off like, you know, I'm a top fan or I've earned this through effort, you know, blood, sweat and tears, maybe not literally blood, but you know, the, the message implies is that you've earned it. And that's the significance of badges and stickers. The next one's uh, leaderboards and social interactions. So leaderboards are a good way to kind of create a sense of you're not alone in the experience of other people as well. But there's also some dangers in using leaderboards, right? Because it creates a sense of competition. And if you are very, very far behind from say the top 10, for example, you might not bother to even climb up the ranks, right? Because if you start off from zero, or in this case, maybe your number 100,000, whatever it may be, and you're trying to go to number one, and the gap is so big, you might feel discouraged to even bother. Like, why should I waste my time trying to climb this when I'm never going to get there, right? But at the same time, if you know how to use it, it can be a good way to kind of show you a sense of progress as well. You know, how well are you doing? Where do you stand in ev with everyone else in your group or in the experience or whatever it may be? Uh, and one great way to do this is by breaking up the leaderboards into different segments as well. You know you could have different tiers or you can have different uh, categories or groups and so on and so forth. So in that way, you may be able to rank higher in some areas or, but lower in some. So it doesn't feel so bad, right? And in the last image is another example of, uh, well, a social interaction in this case, right? So this is from Facebook. You know, when you get to comment or like, this is a form of social interaction. It doesn't always have to be verbal in nature. But as long as you're able to communicate with other people, there is a social aspect to it. Similar to leaderboards as well. Because leaderboards can only work if there's other people in the experience as well. Right? And this also creates a sense of social proof. That means that social proof means there's other people using the experience, which gives you a sense of value in the experience. Because if other people use it, that means there must be something good about it. Right? So that's social proof.
So let's move on to the last one, which is rewards and collectibles. So these are things that you can earn or redeem through effort. So we talked about points earlier and currency. So if you have enough of those, you can redeem certain benefits or even just quirky things for the experience to kind of give you a, a better uh, experience in, the product, in any particular product or service, right? So in one example, you'll see with the owls, those are basically from Duolingo. So when you collect enough gems, you can actually redeem these unique outfits for your avatar. It doesn't mean anything, but to the user, it might be interesting to look at a different avatar. And if they have enough gems, why not? They spend it on something that they find valuable, right? Or in some instances, you can collect points from, say, uh, loyalty programs, like say Grab in this particular image. When you buy a lot of food or you, you spend on transportation, you collect all these Grab points, which you can redeem for discounts and other rewards in the, ex in the app itself. And the last one is from Lazada. So Lazada has tried various kinds of rewards in their experience or in their e-commerce app, where depending on what you do, you'll just get a random reward. And this may work for some people, it may not work for some, from some others, but it is still a form of reward that you can collect, right? So those are some examples of common elements that you find in UX design. Are they the best? It really depends on what you're trying to build, right? As we were sharing earlier, just because it works for some people, it doesn't mean it'll work for you. And how do you know what works for you? You really need to understand a lot of different things. And we'll talk about this a little more after this. So let's take a, take a short break and I'll see you in a few minutes. It is becoming increasingly difficult to engage users in an experience. With increasing distractions and shortening attention spans, it takes considerable effort to keep users continuously engaged, let alone drive their behaviors in a way that positively impacts your bottom line. In order to increase user engagement and brand loyalty, companies have resorted to providing extrinsic rewards to users in exchange for carrying out a particular behavior, such as signing up for a newsletter, adding items to the shopping cart, or returning to the same service provider over and over again. Though effective, such rewards quickly become expensive to upkeep, and users continue to become harder to engage over time as they turn their attention to more interesting options in the market. Gamification has quickly become a buzzword among professionals across industries over the past decade, with increasing interest in applying gamification in various ways in order to drive user engagement. Combined with behavioral design principles, which examines the psychology behind behaviors and habits, gamification has begun to uncover hidden value in existing experiences by effectively incorporating game elements in an environment to drive desired user behaviors. Today, gamification can be seen in different environments, such as social media platforms, e-commerce websites, mobile applications, and classrooms. With engagement becoming the new currency for success, it is no surprise that many organizations are incorporating gamified elements into their products and services in order to increase their user base and ultimately their bottom line. Recur Consult has worked with various organizations across the region to craft engaging user experiences in any environment. Speak to our consultants to learn more about our consultation services and how gamification can drive your business results today. Welcome back. So we talked about some gamified examples earlier on. So now let's talk about what happens if you don't use gamification correctly. So there's some pitfalls to using gamification. And it's not because of gamification itself, it's because of poor application of gamification. The first one is that making challenges a bit too easy. So when it's too easy, it becomes kind of boring for the user. And this lends to the fact that some experiences have too low of a bar to come across. So for example, logging in already awards you with something. Or doing something as simple or as uh, basic as filling up your account uh, information also gives you a certain reward. Which is okay in some instances, but if done too many times in that format, it can be seen as too easy. So all the rewards that are given seem to be less significant to the user, right? Another one is that it's too difficult. The challenges are too hard to do and it creates a sense of friction for the user. If it's too difficult to start off with especially, 
especially at the very beginning of the experience, then the user will feel uncomfortable in the experience, right? This is too hard to overcome. This is too difficult for me to understand. Why am I wasting my time? And then they will just leave the experience, which is probably worse than making it too easy, right? So the right thing to do here is to have a balance. It's okay to have some easy stuff, by the same time, you want to make sure that there's some level of difficulty added to it as they progress. And if you want to make things difficult, it's also okay. But make sure that it's when they are already comfortable and very uh, adept with the experience. So maybe towards the end, when they've done pretty much everything, you make things a lot more harder towards the end. So that when they see it, it becomes more of a practical and doable challenge as opposed to something that's very impossible for them to do at the time. The next one is when you have too many elements, they tend to overshadow the experience. And this is very true, especially if the game elements are not relevant to the experience. They don't actually add or actually contribute any real value or benefit to the user and their experience. Right? So this is where the danger comes in when you are using gamification for the sake of gamifying something, such as points, badges, and leaderboards. If you assume that adding points, badges, or anything similar to that to an experience without really giving it much thought, and thinking that that would give you a lot more value in the experience, you could be falling into this trap where the elements tend to overshadow experience and kind of derail the direction that you want the users to go. It becomes an unwanted competition or becomes a, a goal of collecting things that have no meaning, right? And this will lend itself to another issue which is becoming visual noise and distractions, right? Because you distract them from what you're supposed to do if, for example, you want them to buy something from your shop, if you are putting a leaderboard or you're putting a point system that doesn't really contribute any benefit in that behavior, then there's really no point in having it in the first place. So one good way to kind of filter this through is basically understand what objectives you're trying to achieve and whether the game elements that you have in mind actually contribute positively to that objective. If it doesn't, then you might want to consider getting rid of those. So let's move on. So how do you drive desired behaviors then? So we talked about some examples of gamified elements and some ways it can go wrong. So how do you know what to do and how to do it properly, right? So there's some things that you want to keep in mind. So this is by BJ Fogg. So BJ Fogg is a behavioral psychologist and he made this called the BJ Fogg's behavioral model. And I use this a lot in my consultation work as well. And it basically talks about three things. If you want to drive behaviors, you need one, motivation, you need ability, and you need a trigger, right? And they must come in the right balance, otherwise you won't get the right outcomes or behaviors that you want to see, right? So let's dive in a bit more as to what these three things really are. So the first one is motivation. So motivation basically means you have something that motivates someone to do something. And depending on what that something is, if it's something very easy to do, the amount of motivation needed is a lot lesser, right? Because it's very easy. But if it's something that's very difficult to do, you need to add a lot of motivation so that they are willing to even do the task, right? The next one is ability. This basically talks about whether people or the user are actually able to do that particular action or task. If it's something very difficult, then you might want to consider teaching them how to do it first. But if it's something very easy, then that's best because then they don't have to be taught and it's very automatic. It's seamless to them. So if it's something difficult, you must teach them. But if it's something easy, then you probably don't have to do any teaching at all. And both are fine depending on what you're trying to do. So if, for example, if you're trying to gamify a training environment or a classroom, obviously the things they learn may be difficult at times. And you need to teach them how to do those things. Otherwise, they will not be willing or will not be able to have the ability to complete the task. And the last one is a trigger or a call to action. If this trigger and call to action is not present or even obvious in the experience, they may not realize they have to do it, right? There's nothing that triggers them in their minds to do that particular action. And when you have all these three elements present, then you can drive pretty much any behavior. Remember, you have to have the right levels of motivation, you have to make sure that the ability to do that particular behavior and task is there in, within the user. Otherwise, you have to teach them. And there's a clear trigger that they can take action upon and they actually notice in the experience. So let's look at one example that we're all very familiar with. So when it comes to Facebook, I'm pretty sure a lot of you who are watching this have at least heard of Facebook or actually have an account, right? So when you have Facebook, 
You even may have the app on your phone and obviously Facebook will want you to do certain things such as opening the Facebook app, right? And how do they do this? If you would look at this model, there are three things they would have. One is motivation. So they, different users will have different motivations to using Facebook. But for this example, we've used FOMO. So fear of missing out. So you want to know what's happening with your friends or what's going on right now on online and the internet because Facebook is a great place to see what's trending, what's going on, what everyone's talking about, right? What are the current trends? So that's where FOMO comes in. You're motivated to find out what's going on. And the ability here is very simple. Click a, a notification, right? Which in this case would be the trigger, which is a notification that appears on your phone. So what happens is that when you're just sitting by yourself or doing something, suddenly you get a notification on your phone and you find out it's from Facebook. And maybe you're curious, oh, what's happening? Uh, what's going on? And that notification could be related to, say, a friend or a new news uh, article or information that has been shared by a favorite group of yours. And once you click on it, which is very easy to do, you have opened Facebook. So this is a very simple example, but you can see that all three key elements are present. And that is able to drive the behavior that, in this case, would be opening the app, which is the Facebook app. All right, so let's continue. So one thing you want to avoid is cognitive friction. So cognitive friction happens when they have a mismatch in the outcome of an action versus uh, their expectation, right? So they've come in with some expectation already, but then it didn't really pan out the way they wanted to, or the experience that they expected didn't really become what they expected it to be. And this can impair the user experience. So how do you circumvent this? Basically, you want to make sure the experience is as seamless and as comfortable as possible, right? Of course, there are some instances where you want to create some form of friction because maybe it's part of a classroom activity or a learning experience, and that's fine. But again, when you do that, you must make sure that you kind of uh, balance it out with a lot of hand-holding, a lot of guidance, and also a lot of teaching. But in most cases, if, especially if you're trying to build a product or experience uh, in a service, you probably want to reduce cognitive friction as much as possible. Make sure that it's very comfortable and ultimately if the user feels stupid using the experience, then there's probably a lot of cognitive friction involved. So you want, to feel, you want them to feel that they are really smart in the experience because nobody likes to feel bad when they try something, right? So if you put yourself in their shoes and you feel that, oh, you know what, this is a bit difficult to do, you might want to consider making it easier. Right? Whether it's easy to find something, easier to understand something, and so on and so forth. So how do you then design something to appeal to your users? So in UX design, you always look at the personas. So who are your main users? And in gamification, there's also a similar thing called player types. Uh, and these are pretty general, and it's actually a good start to understand what motivates people to engage with an experience. So if you look at these examples, you see that there are six types of players, the first one being socializers. And as the name implies, they're driven by social interactions to be able to connect with people. If you have an element of social interaction or social influence in a particular experience, then you're able to appeal to socializers. And these are typically extroverts or people who just like other people, right? Uh, and the next one are free spirits. These are people who like to create and explore. They like to exercise their creativity. They like to kind of see what's around them. And you, if you are this sort of person, you'll find that in this conference, you'll have a lot of places to explore. You have a lot of booths to go to. You have a lot of places to, to kind of travel to using your avatars. And this creates a sense of curiosity. You want to know what's over there, what's, what to expect. And in some ways, allows you to kind of express your uh, creativity by trying different things in the experience. Because as you can see, there are different things you can do here and you're not told what to do, you're just given a lot of options to kind of choose from. And this appeals very well to free spirits. The next one are achievers. Achievers, they like to basically look for new things to learn and to improve themselves by overcoming challenges. So it's, they basically like something difficult or something difficult enough yet easy enough to do so that they feel that there's a sense of accomplishment in what they do. And that's why the missions are here, for example. It gives you uh, something to kind of learn and do. And by completing them, you feel a sense of accomplishment. And achievers are very uh, appreciative of such elements. The next one is philanthropists. 
they basically want to give back to others. They want to help others. And they basically like to enrich the lives of others without any reward in return. And this could be by helping people, by giving back in some way, such as volunteering or just, you know, helping others in any way they can. And if you add this sort of component into experience, philanthropists will also be interested in engaging with your experience. The next one is players. They are basically the typical player stereotype. They like to collect rewards, badges, they like to climb the ranks in the leaderboard. They basically are in it for the game and to win that game, right? And you want to give them a lot of opportunities to collect things, right? To earn things through effort. And similar to the achievers, but in this case, they're doing it for rewards rather than the actual sense of accomplishment. And the last one are disruptors. So disruptors are actually very, very difficult to build for because they, their main focus is just disrupt the system. They just want to force a change and that change could be a good or a bad thing. So they'll look at an experience and point out faults or limitations and push for change. And usually these are people that we don't really design for, but we instead try to manage, right? So how do you manage people who are looking to change something about the experience? You could include them in the process, for example, you get their feedback, and so on and so forth. So in this case, if you notice in your personal terminal, there's a place where you can give feedback to the developers or to the organizations, or organizers of this event so that they can actually consider changing parts of what you may or may not like or want to see more of in the next version of Data Asia, for example. Right? So these are typical player types. But do you need to design it for these people? Maybe, maybe not. Because it really depends on who are your main users. Because some of your main users may not fall into these categories, right? So it doesn't mean you should include everything, but if you can, that would be good as long as you know how to balance the different elements. But if you can't include every single type of game element, then you might want to choose your battles and choose who your main users are and how do you basically give them the best experience because at the end of the day, if they are the ones who will give you the most benefit in terms of your business objectives, and your business metrics, then it's best to just focus on those predominantly. So let's talk about motivation a bit more, right? So we talked about different player types, we talked about different game elements and some examples. So how do you basically create a very motivating experience, right? And as you've seen in the player types, they're motivated by different things. So we want to expand that a bit further. So if you didn't want to look at player types specifically and you wanted to look at motivations, what motivations are out there? So there are typically eight core drives of human motivation. <coughs> so this is the Octalysis framework by Yukai Chao. So based on these eight, the first you'll see is meaning or epic meaning and calling. So this is the first core drive and basically means a user is interested or motivated to do something that is bigger than themselves or if they're chosen to do something. Kind of like being lucky to be chosen for a particular or a very important task to do. Not based on merit, but purely based on luck, right? So, or kind of doing something that's bigger than themselves, such as volunteering. So this is similar to the philanthropists that we talked about earlier. They want to give back, not for personal gain, but to help others. So if you know that your user is motivated by this core drive, you want to include that element of giving back or helping others, not for reward, but just for the sake of helping others, or giving them a chance to be selected for something purely out of luck, kind of being the chosen one, right? The second one is accomplishment. So accomplishment is similar to achievers. You give them a chance to learn something and accomplish different challenges and different tasks. And this usually increases in difficulty. They like the sense of completing something, achieving something, because they put in the effort and they see the results of and all the fruits of their labor, right? So similar to achievers, they want something to kind of overcome and complete. Kind of like missions that we talked about earlier. The next one is empowerment of creativity and feedback. So basically, you want to give them a chance to express themselves creatively, uh, creatively and also to kind of get the right feedback when they want it. So this is basically immediate feedback. When they do something, they get immediate feedback for that particular task. It's kind of like a reward of sorts. Or you give them a chance to express themselves. They allow them to do some, something such as create content that they can share or write something to other people in any way they want and so on and so forth. So this is similar to free spirits that we talked about earlier. So they respond to creativity and being able to express themselves freely 
or to explore the environment and get that immediate feedback from exploring different things when they go into a specific room or click a certain button there's a, a feedback that they get that becomes very satisfying to them in the experience the fourth core drive is ownership so ownership basically is about collecting things whether it's collecting points or collecting rewards or collecting things that they can uh, earn in the environment or the experience and sometimes used specifically in that particular experience Sometimes it can be used outside, such as a reward or a discount that you can redeem outside the particular platform that you're in. But basically, it involves collecting things, right? And the next one is social influence. This basically means anything that involves other people, such as leaderboards that we talked about earlier, or interacting with other people, or competing with other people, or even collaborating or being a team with other people. As long as there's other people involved, it will fall into social influence. And this is actually a very important thing. Even if you assume that people or your users are not social creatures or they're not very extroverted, by the end of the day, humans are social in nature. We want to interact with people. It's just about how much interaction that they want. So it's, very, it's a very good thing to have some small form of social influence or interactions in your experience if you can. So in this particular conference for example you're able to interact with other users you can chat with them you can get to know them you can exchange business cards the social aspects are very strong because again the networking opportunities are supposed to be present in a conference so you can see that's a very strong uh, presence of this particular core drive the next one is scarcity scarcity is basically wanting something because you can't have it because it's too limited in amounts or it's too hard to get because there are certain conditions that have to be met to be able to earn these things, right? And some people are driven by this. It's human nature to want something that you can't have. That's why we're driven by sales that are limited in time or things that are limited quantities because they feel exclusive. They feel like, you know, I have this, I'm one of the few who have managed to get it and it becomes more valuable to me. But in reality, it may not be that case. But again, that's how humans respond to scarcity. The next one is unpredictability and curiosity. This is basically being able to explore or kind of satisfy your curiosity. And this can go in two ways. Curiosity is more positive, but unpredictability can be less positive. If you are not comfortable with something, you're not certain what's going to happen next, and that can create a sense of discomfort. And if used correctly, you can basically drive someone to do something so they can, they can avoid uncertainty. And if you do that, they're motivated to carry out that task because they're afraid of something negative happening, right? They don't know what it is, but they'd rather not find out. And humans, we're not, we don't like things that we're not comfortable with or we're not sure of unless you are talking about curiosity. Such as a cliffhanger in a story. You want to know what happens next. And that could be a positive way to drive that sort of motivation. And the last is avoidance. Avoidance is a very... Uh, Powerful but yet very dangerous core drive to use. Basically, is this avoiding losing something or something negative happening to you? And this has I we've seen many examples of this in the past. And if not used correctly, you can actually traumatize the user. For example, if you were to look at say Facebook, for example, if Facebook had a condition where if you didn't log in uh, at least once in say two weeks, you will basically lose your entire account. Will delete everything. And that is basically a huge sense of loss. And if you had a good reason for not logging in and suddenly you lose everything, that can be quite traumatizing, especially if you're a long-term user. You've collected so many friends already, you've made so many connections, you have so many posts, and then you just lose it all just because. And that can cripple the experience or cripple the user. So it can be very powerful because then they'll be afraid to lose something, so they're, they're motivated to log in. But at the same time, if they could not carry out that particular task because of whatever reason, and they lose everything in, in, as a result, it can create a lot of frustration, and they will probably not come back to the experience at all. So use this with caution. Of course, the example I gave is rather drastic and unlikely for Facebook to actually use, but it is a real example that some companies may have used in the past. For example, Duolingo, they had this particular uh, element in where if you actually did not log in once every day, you will actually lose your streak. And you could have a streak for about hundreds of days and you could just lose it all just because of, say, an issue with the app or an issue with your mobile device or your internet and you couldn't log in that particular day and all that progress is lost. 
And they took advantage of this in the past where if you wanted to kind of get back your streak, you actually had to pay money. And they actually kind of rubbed the wrong way with a lot of users. In the end, they felt like, you know what, I feel I'm being taken advantage of and I'm just not going to come back. I'm frustrated. They have since removed that element uh, and replaced it with something more positive. But you can see that using this core drive in a correctly can lead to really negative outcomes. Right? So use this with caution. Okay? So these different motivations can actually be split further. Right? So you'll see in the next slide that the Octalysis framework is broken up into two different, two different types as well. So you can actually look at it at two different types of motivations, extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic motivations basically means there is an extrinsic reward to be earned from completing a particular task or by basically following this particular motivation. For example, accomplishing something could mean earning a reward. Ownership means you collect things. And scarcity means you get something that's kind of hard to get or limited in amount. And this lends itself to being extrinsic in nature. Whereas on the other side, it's more intrinsically motivated. Basically, you're doing something for internal rewards. There's nothing physical or basically tangible to collect, but it's all about how you feel. Basically, empowerment and creativity, for example, gives you a sense of satisfaction from being able to express yourself or being able to explore certain things. Social influence gives you a sense of satisfaction when you are able to connect with people in different ways or even complete, uh, compete with them in a competition, for example, because you get the sense of social interaction with them. And unpredictability basically will manage either your curiosity or avoid uncertain things that you're not comfortable with. And all these are all intrinsically motivated, right? So again, one is extrinsic, meaning there is something outside for you to earn. And one is within, which is intrinsic for you to earn within yourself, right? So I want to also talk about the user journey. So when you understand the different elements, the different types of users, and also how to motivate them in different ways, then it comes down to how do you build this into experience? Should you just cram everything into one, and then when they come in and all of this starts flooding into their, their peripheral vision, and they're able to digest everything immediately. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work that way. And we, as humans, can only digest and understand things in certain amounts, maybe bite size. So the first thing that happens is in the journey of a user is they discover the experience. And this basically means they learn to experience whether intentionally or by accident. And this could be from marketing or maybe just from word of mouth or just through your curiosity in exploring say online and you stumble upon a particular product or experience. And once you've come in, well, the first thing you do will bring you into the onboarding phase. So when you are in this phase, you basically learn how to use the experience or how to complete the tasks in the experience that you need to do, right? So it's kind of like the tutorial stage. And this is a very important stage that people tend to skip, right? They assume that people will find a way to understand how to use something just because there's enough motivation built in. And that's not often the case. So sometimes you must handhold them a little bit, even if it's for simple things, because to the user, it may not be very obvious. Uh, you can circumvent this or make this easier by making things very noticeable or very easy to use. But at the end of the day, it's always good to kind of have a little bit of onboarding to teach them even the basic things to make sure that you have a higher chance of success. Because if, you do, if, they, uh, if they don't know how to use it, they will probably leave the experience quite quickly. So once they've learned everything, what happens is that they enter the scaffolding phase. And in this phase, they actually build up on the experience and do everything that, they can, that can be done in the particular experience. So they basically do things over and over again. And most of the time, they'll be stuck in this particular phase. Whether it's, uh, for example, if it's Facebook, it could be adding friends. It could be posting content, sharing content liking, commenting, joining groups, and so on and so forth. So this is something that you can do over and over again and not really lose its novelty. And if there is something that can be lost in terms of novelty, you can manage it by increasing difficulty, right? So if it's easy at the beginning, as they progress in this phase, it gets harder and harder and harder so that they don't feel disengaged or bored from doing the same thing over and over. So the main question you want to ask yourself in this particular stage is, how do you get people engaged when they keep doing the same thing over and over. Facebook, once again, one good example is they keep changing the content 
that is presented. So now, even though you can do the same things, the kind of content you see is, has been changed a little bit to kind of follow the trends in the market. So now you see more videos, for example, as opposed to just seeing status updates from people that was more common in the past. Now it's more about videos and articles that are more prevalent to you, right? And the last stage is mastery and end game. So depending on the experience, it will either be a mastery phase or an end game phase. If it's mastery, it's for experiences that don't really end. They kind of continue until forever, right? Kind of like social media. So this is when users become veterans of the experience. You've kind of done everything at least once and they've kind of been very, uh, they've become an expert in everything. They know how everything works, they've done everything. So then what's next? What else can they do? So you might want to give them certain different things that only they can do. For example, you could become a pioneer or you could become a founder of a group on say Facebook. Or you can get certain benefits that only uh, experienced users can get. For example, you could provide specific feedback to the developers because you're a veteran of the experience and they value your feedback. So depending on who your users are and what experience you're trying to create, you want to ask yourself what happens next? Or if it does end, how does it end? What happens at the end? Do they get, say, an assessment at the end? Do they get a certain certificate at the end? What happens at the end of the experience? Because there must be a good way to end. And human nature is that we will remember when things end really well. We don't remember what happens at the beginning, but we, have, we really remember what happens at the end. So you want to end things on the right note. right? So I think that pretty much sums up uh, my talk today. So I really hope you enjoyed this segment on gamification and UX design. And if you want to connect with me and find out more on gamification or you have any questions, you can scan this QR code with your mobile device or you can drop me an email, drop me a message or just visit our website to find out more about my company, Rico Consult. So thank you so much for listening in. I hope you enjoyed the experience and I hope to connect with you outside of this uh, sometime soon. So Enjoy the rest of the conference and I hope you have a great day ahead. Take care and stay safe.